there are two different types of desire. There's a spontaneous desire and responsive desire. What happens most often is that a couple comes into therapy and they're struggling with differences in desire. Typically, they describe it as one person has a higher desire and the other person has a lower desire or no desire whatsoever. And sometimes it happens that both people come in with low sexual desire. The issue with understanding it as low or high is that um, you start to try to apply what you know about one desire to the other in order to raise it. Rather than understanding that the desires are different, and that they each need something um, different from each other in order to open up and to not close down. Spontaneous desire is a type of desire that's not really affected by anything. It's ready to go at any time. It's um, not affected whether there's people are tired or stressed or the relationship is in conflict. That desire is ready to go at all times. And, um, and it's really hard for that type of desire to understand the responsive desire, which is quite different from that, the responsive desire is very affected by what surrounds it. It's affected by how the relationship is doing, whether there's conflict, whether there's violence, whether there's, um, you know, like avoidance or, or stonewalling or not paying attention, no intimacy. It's also affected by what's happening inside themselves, whether how the, good they feel about themselves, how good they feel in their bodies whether they're being, they have stress, whether they have mental health issues, depression, anxiety, especially anxiety because anxiety is something that keeps you in your head a lot. And if you're in your head a lot, you can't be in your body, which is where the sexual desire resides. So the individual factors also affect responsive desire. Not only that, um, contextual factors um, affect sexual desires, such as you know, if there's been a move, if, if the job is stressful, if um, the place that they're living doesn't agree to, with them. So anything that has to do with their surroundings, their environment also affects sexual desire. It shuts it down. The other area that shuts down sexual desire is if, any, if there's any form of addiction. So we're talking about like any type of any type of addiction. It can go from gambling, work, exercise. The point being is that that person is unavailable, is going to engage in something else. And so the person with the responsive desire doesn't really have what it needs in order to open up because this person is unavailable, this person, there's some betrayal there, and it's difficult to feel connected and have intimacy. The other addiction that seems to be really prevalent and it does affect desire on both desires on the spontaneous and the responsive is um, porn use now porn use can affect the person that's engaging in the porn because you get used to a certain stimuli just like when you're masturbating you get used to a certain rhythm and a certain pressure and then when somebody else comes to touch you it's not quite the same and it doesn't give you as much pleasure and, and maybe not even reach help you reach orgasm so the same thing with porn if you're used to having the stimuli and then you transition into your relationship with your partner those visuals and and even the sounds and the type of person and the, the situation isn't there so it's really hard for you to become excited and to feel pleasure now on the other side of things a person that is engaged with somebody that has porn, porn use heavy porn use is is also affected that their desire is affected because um they don't feel the connection they don't feel the intimacy they're they're they've probably had a few betrayals with this they and on top of that they feel like what's wrong with me that you can get excited with these other type of people but not with me what's wrong with me that you you can't find our sexual encounter satisfying now none of this is neither true nor false but it's more to understand how people come into to this to session and how they understand what's going on. To end, there's two different types of desire, and it's really important to understand that there's two ways of doing this because what often happens is that the person with the spontaneous desire typically says, well, why can't you just do this? I do so much for you already. 
I, when I don't want to, why can't you just do this one thing for me? And look, you even like it when you, when you, when you do this thing. But the issue is that with the responsive desire, it doesn't work that way. It, responsive desire needs to be inspired. It needs to be, um, yeah, that just that inspired. And so it's really difficult for it to say, okay, I'm going to do this thing and, and I'm going to make, make myself have sex. I like it once I have it. Uh, and people do that, but there are some consequences to that. Some of the consequences from engaging in spontaneous sex when you have responsive, spontaneous desire when you have responsive desire is that um, it starts to erode your desire a bit. We went over the different types of desire. So what happens when these two desires um, are in a relationship and the responsive desire starts to be affected what, by what's going on around them. And this happens often because when you first get together, you're having lots of sex. It's really exciting. Um, you can't stop from putting your hands on, on each other. And then you get married or you set up house together or even some time passes in your relationship and sex starts to go down a bit. And the person with the responsive desire starts to be affected by the things in their context like we talked about um, last video. And what happens is when they're affected by these contextual things, then their desire goes down and the person that has a spontaneous desire can't understand it. It, it, it. The question is like, why can't we have sex like we used to? What, why have you lost your desire? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with us? People don't understand that the responsive desire starts to be affected by things like what we talked about, like the relationship, what's going on with them, what's going on outside of the home, and um, whether there's any sort of conflict around them, any abuse, any sexual abuse, any addiction, all those things. And the reason why the response to the desire wasn't affected by that at the beginning of the relationship is that no one's affected by anything at the beginning of the relationship you know, you're basically high on chemicals. And so you don't feel the pain that you normally feel. You're not, you don't feel the distress you normally feel because you are basically high. And then, um, so once you come down from that high, you start to feel some of the things that you weren't feeling before, or be affected by some of the things that you weren't affected before. And nobody is, do is malicious in this. Nobody's doing this with any intent. It is what happens. And so to understand that, at the beginning, things were different because of those dynamics and that then responsive desire starts to be affected by certain things. What typically happens is the people get together, like I said, they have tons of sex. Then some time passes, they either move in together, they, ha they get married or um, they just have a longer engagement. And that responsive desire starts to dwindle a little bit and the person with the spontaneous desire is fine i mean everybody's okay well most people are okay with hey you don't want to have sex that's fine i understand but if it um if it goes a little bit longer or a little bit more frequent the person um with the spontaneous desire will start to get frustrated and angry and or sad and withdrawn and what that does is that with the person with the responsive desire is um, pretty affected by that. Be not only affected because in the way that they're not gonna really wanna have sex, but also affected because they love this person and they wanna have a good relationship. They wanna have a good sexual relationship. And what happens then is that then they feel pressure. They feel pressure to have sex in order to smooth things over, in order to make peace, in order to have this person be happy. So we'll often see um, like a few, a week or two of some build up, some um, no sex where the person starts to get more and more agitated. And then there's sort of a blow up or an incident or a discussion. And then the person that has the responsive desire just w goes and has sex just to kind of appease the situation or the person. And, and so in some way they're, um, pushing themselves to have sex when they really don't want to. The problem with this is that everybody has, <laughs> most people will have sex when 
they don't want to in order to please their partner that's totally normal and acceptable but if it happens continuously and over a long period of time then what happens is it starts to erode the sex the response of sexual desire they'll feel less and less desire as time goes on and it kind of makes sense because if i don't know if you if you liked if you weren't into suddenly you were eating hamburgers and then ah i don't feel like hamburgers any anymore right now for a while and some and, and then you feel like oh but i have to i should and you start to eat them when you don't really want to your desire for those hamburgers is probably going to go down we start with the first step which is to not engage in any more sex that you don't want to have and that is difficult it sounds pretty easy and the, your partner's probably saying oh just what just what we needed just what you wanted now you just get permission to um not want to do this and they probably will say well now we'll never have sex because if we wait to have sex when when it comes out of you know when it comes up for you organically we'll never do it so that's understandable that's pretty normal to feel that way and the purpose of this is to get you what you want it's not to torture you so this is a temporary step in order to get you more a more satisfying sexual relationship because of what we've talked about in the past it's an important step it's important it's a step that is needed and it's a temporary step eventually after a while you'll be able to engage in sex that maybe you don't want to every once in a while but for now we kind of need to clear clear things up and give your desire some room to figure out what it wants and what it needs so the first step is to stop having sex that you don't want to um, ask yourself do i am i doing this because i want to or am i doing this because i it's to please the other person or is to appease the other person and as i said it's really hard so i think we need to acknowledge that the other person is, this is not easy for them this is it's not easy to say no to the person that you love especially with something so important what you want to do is do the exercise understanding my desire after you stopped having the sex that um you don't really want to have so, to start having the conversation with yourself of what is it that closes it down what is it that opens it up for me so that we start to develop a list of things that um can contribute to having more sexual desire and this takes a while your body needs to kind of adjust to the idea of like i'm not going to do this thing that i've been doing for a while it's really hard to be on the other side of these of this process where you're asked to take a step back when you're already pretty upset about not having the sexual relationship that you desire or maybe that you deserve and suddenly now you're going to have to take a step a step back and wait for that person to come to you rather than you go to them but the goal of doing that is not to punish you or to make things worse for you or to not get you what you want it's actually the opposite it's to actually get you where you want to go and change the dynamic that's been going on for a while so for you to become really calm in the process and not put more pressure on your partner is super important although it's very difficult it's important for the process for the dynamic to change so you want to do the best that you that you can in becoming very zen about sex some of the things that i've learned that help in this process is first give your brain a time frame say six months tell your brain that this is temporary this is something that you're going to do for six months and that tends to calm the brain down instead of you know leaving it open-ended where it starts to get anxious and thinks you know, and doubt whether this is this is going to go on forever and etc. So that's one thing. The other thing is make sure you you know you can talk about this. You can talk about how difficult it is. You can talk about oh, I, what I really want to do is go back to what I've done before. What I really want to do is show or or talk about how upset I am with my partner. But the best thing is for you to talk to somebody else about that because remember that the object is to remove the pressure for. For your partner to figure out what they want to do with sex so 
find somebody to talk to about it. You can you can schedule a therapy appointment or you can talk to a friend, but stay away from talking to your partner about it because again, you don't want to put more pressure on them. How to identify your woundings and how to manage them and communicate them. And the reason we want to do that is to improve communication. The reason communication is so important is because when you start to feel these pressures, as well as the unmet needs that you have about sex, a lot of that stuff results in, in wounding. And then it leads to really hard ways of communicating with each other that sometimes feel like it's spiraling out of control because what happens in these ways of communicating is that each person is touching on each other's wound, which makes the commu communication really difficult and hard to resolve and get a grasp of, gra get a grasp on. So we want to talk about um, wounding because it affects the way we communicate. Unless we understand what our wounding, our pain points are, it, in these interactions that we've been having for years or maybe a few months in regards to sex, it's really difficult to change the way that we communicate. So the focusing on communication, that faulty communication leads to conflict in the relationship and conflict also leads to faulty communication. There's a bi-directional process. So if you start out with negative associations around sex, you have pressure to perform, pressure to have sex, then you have some unmet needs. Everyone seems to be hurt in some way. And on top of that, you're not communicating in a way that's effective or healthy. That just adds another layer of problems to the whole situation. And, and, and also, you know, communicating can some, most often is one of the best ways to heal from some of these issues. So communication is really important and we want to address it. And one of the ways to, to address it is to understand what happens between people in, you know, in hard situations and how they're hurt and how to manage that hurt. So for example, if I feel rejected because you don't want to have sex with me, that could lead me to feel like I'm not desirable, that you didn't, don't desire me. And hence, maybe you don't love me and even we, I, we could go further and say, if you don't love me, you don't desire me, you'll eventually leave me. So I'm creating all these meanings around this interaction, which causes me some thoughts and some feelings that are painful. And on top of that, if I have any history of feeling um, not desirable, or like I said before, or my value has been very tied to that, then it's going to hurt even more. So when I feel that, that pain, what I'm going to do is, is probably say something that's not that. I'm going to say something like, um, you don't care about, all you care about is your work. You never want to spend time with me. You don't want to have sex anymore. Uh, you just, you're a loser because you're not sexual. All kinds of things we communicate about the other person. You, 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 you. And we fail to communicate, I am her, I am in pain, which is so different as far as communication goes and as far as healing the problem to begin with, that it's super important to get right. Because what happens typically is I say something like, you never, you never cared about me to begin with. You, you're just using me. And guess what's going to happen? The other person is going to get quite defensive. Most likely those things that we say to the other person are probably not true all the time or probably not even true to the extent that we're communicating it. So the other person is gonna get defensive. And when they get defensive, they're talking, they're speaking from a place of hurt as well. Because when you say you don't care about me or you never wanna have sex, that hurts me, it could hurt me because it feels like I've done something wrong. And if I have any history of feeling like I've done something wrong, then that makes me be more in pain and I will react in a certain way to that comment by either like lashing back at you or withdrawing from you. And so all these, what we call a dance, you just keep on dancing with each other. One person, you know, steps this way, touches my ouch, and then I step towards them and touch their ouch. And we just keep on going and going and going. 
And that's why a lot of people, a lot of pe couples find themselves in this downward spiral where they can't recover from because it's just, it's never ending. You know, you find things that aren't on, that are not true, that, that hurt. And so we keep on going that back and forth and there's no end to it until we just kind of <laughs> just give up or get tired or whatever. But the point is that with this type of communication and all, um, it doesn't really lead to any, any, anything good. It doesn't really lead to making the situation better. So what we need to do is understand how to communicate in a different way by understanding what our wounding is. So the next section is focused on, let's understand what your wounding is. Let's learn how to communicate it. Let's learn how to listen to each other when we're talking from this place so that our communication can become stronger in order to help us heal from these things that are very painful. One of the most important things, like I said before, in order to increase communication is to know, is to regulate your emotions. So in order to regulate our emotions, we need to know what they are. And we also need to know what, oh, this is the emotion that's coming up for me, but are there other emotions there? And, and why is this emotion coming up for me? Is there a history there? So what we want to do is be able to find out whether the emotions that we're having are the only emotions that we're having. And also if there's a history with it, because if I have, like I said before, if I feel like I'm not good enough when we don't have sex and I have a history of not feeling good enough, then we need to not only address how that feeling is coming up in the relationship, but how it, how it has come up for a really long time before I even got in this relationship. And I don't, some of you may already know what your pain points are, and some of you are, are probably not aware of them. So there's an exercise that will help you um, first identify what your theme is, what your pain points are. Once you identify what your pain points are, then you want to be able to also understand how you cope with those pain points. Because you want to see, oh, my pain point is I'm not good enough. And what I do when I feel like I'm not good enough is move away from the situation. Or what I do when I'm not good enough is move towards the other person, try to get some answers, try to get some security, try to get some um, love. So we need to know not only what our core um, pain points are, but also how we cope with those pain points. So there's another exercise that's also going to help you in you know, understanding how you cope with these emotions that come up for you. And in these exercises, you're also going to share it with your partner so that your partner understands, oh, so when this is going on, this is what's actually going on. So when you move away from me, it's not that you don't like me. It's that you're scared that I, you're not good enough. And so it makes a difference. So now we start to understand our partner's reactions and the way that they behave as something that it's completely different than what we're thinking and also not anything to do with who who we are or what we're doing. Once we understand what our core feelings are and how we cope with them, we want to be able to regulate them better. There are a few steps in regulating emotions and they all have kind of the same goal, which is the goal you I mean the goal is to stay with the feelings, to accept them, to nurture them, to embrace them. What we typically do with feelings that are distressful is we move away from them. We avoid them. We want to forget about them. We want to get busy so we don't even think about them. Because it, that's what we were taught when we were, probably all of us were taught as we were growing up, especially if you're my generation or even, even very, I think things are changing is the point. But most of us were taught like, oh, your emotions? No, don't stay with them. Do you, try to get busy. The first thing people say to you, oh, just do something to entertain yourself. Do something so that you can forget about it. We're not taught like, oh, embrace the feeling. Stay with the feeling. Stay with the distress. It's okay to feel these distressing feelings. So these ways of um, managing or helping you regulate the emotions in a way that's not... Um, that's not going to lead you to more problems is the goal is to stay with emotions. So the first way to do this, and I'll go through each one of them. The first way to do this is to, um, it's a mindful meditative type of process, which I call stay with your feelings. And we'll go over that. The second one is what I would call is uh, looking at our different parts of ourselves. And when we start to look at parts of ourselves, not only are we staying and understanding those feelings, but we're also 
addressing some unconscious things that come up for, 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 uh, for us because we're going into this um, experiential imaginative space with our feelings that um, helps us not just stay with the feelings and understand them more, but also touch on some of these unconscious processes that come up in our pain points. So our pain points, we can become aware of some of them. They're like the tip of the iceberg, but then there might be this you know, the bottom part of the iceberg that we're not even aware of, which we, which we call the unconscious. And some of the best ways to get to the unconscious is to be in a meditative state, because when you stay with the feelings, you're in a meditative state. So some things will come up for you also. But to do these experiential exercises, which one of them is the parts work, which we'll go into, which will help you not only address what's coming up for you on the top on the surface, but also some unconscious things. And the third way, again, very experiential, very powerful, is inner child work that we'll go over as well. And these exercises are meant to be done at certain certain times. So, for example, staying with feelings should be done almost every time you feel a feeling. Um, parts work can be done, especially at the beginning. You're working through some stuff. You want to heal some of these unconscious things, so you want to be heavily focused on the inner child or the parts work at the beginning, and maybe it'll taper off and you'll only have to do it every once in a while. So it's, um, it's, it's a maintenance type of uh, exercise. It would be to be able to communicate your wounding to your partner in, in a way that um, is more productive than you have in the past because you're more aware of it, you can regulate it, and then you want to communicate it. And the communication also helps in the regulation and also helps in the healing. And as well as communicating, the other, the other part that's super important is for the other person to be able to learn how to hold these feelings with you, to be able to suspend their own personal pain while you communicate your pain. Because what, most often what happens is you say, hey, I'm feeling this way and that touches on my pain. And I'm like, whoa, I'm feeling this way. And I wanna talk about how I'm feeling and I suddenly forget about how you're feeling. So that's another important um, piece. Most often what happens is I say something like, I'm feeling unlovable, I'm feeling unloved. And what our, our, the person that we're saying that to says, but wait a second, I love you and I do it all these different ways. And, and, and I, I tell you and I do this and I do that. And what that person is doing is they're feeling some, some, something, right? They're feeling like, oh my God, I'm not loving you in the right way. I'm not loving you enough. I'm doing something wrong. And so they go into their pain point. And what happens is that then the original pain point is forgotten. And that's not what feelings need. Feelings need to be acknowledged, accepted, and embraced. So we need to learn to how to suspend what happens to us when we hear a hard thing from our partners in order for us to be able to join them in validating, accepting, and embracing that feeling is super important because not only does that, that helps the communication because suddenly you're not trailing off into some other thing, and it also helps the, the, the feeling that's coming up be healed in some way. It's very different to be able to say, I'm feeling unloved and your partner's saying something, empathizing with you and saying, oh my God, that's horrible that you're feeling like that. I don't want you to feel like that. And they kind of like, they give you, they don't have to embrace you physically, but it feels like an embrace. It feels like, um, like they're there, they're understanding. And it creates this feeling of like, yeah, I can see you, you understand me. You, you accept this feeling and you get it. Very healing compared to wait a second, I love you this way and I love you that way and I love, and you're like, oh, wait a second, that doesn't feel very embracing or it feels like we're going off somewhere else. And um, especially if we have issues of not being attended to. Once you understand what your wounding is and you have a sentence that goes along with it, you wanna make sure, and you also in some way learning how to regulate it, you want at the same time to start communicating it. Because communicating it does a couple of things like we've talked about before. It helps in the couple dynamic. It helps to be able to say what you really are feeling so that the other person doesn't have to guess what it is or interpret it in a completely different way, which then creates a whole issue in itself. And you also want to communicate it because it helps you heal from that feeling. 
So two very important things. Now, <laughs> communicating what we feel requires that we know kind of like what we tend to gravitate towards. And also in the moment where we're feeling distressed to be able to ask ourselves, well, let's say um, something happens and I feel like um, you, you're, you never do anything with me, right? I, that's the first thought I have. This person doesn't want to be around me. And then you want to ask yourself, well, I know, I know this question sounds silly, but you want to keep on asking yourself kind of the same questions. Like, why, sort of like what you did in the exercise, the worst experience of, of my life. I say, well, why does this bother me? Well, why does this bother me? But, you know, if this were true, why would this bother me? Like, if it's true that my partner doesn't want to spend time with me, why would that bother me? Well, because it means that they don't love me. So it's not the fact that they don't want to spend time with me that hurts. It's the fact that they don't love me that hurts. And you could even go further and say, well, why would that bother you? Let's say it's true that they don't, they don't love you. Why does that bother you? And, and you're like, well, that's stupid. Of course, anybody would be bothered by somebody not loving you. Well, not really. Depends on the circumstances. Depends on the person. So, and then you could say something like, well, that, if they don't love me, that means they'll leave me. They'll leave me. And that, it, it gives you another point of communication, right? It's not that I feel unlovable or that I feel you don't love me. It's actually scared I'm gonna, you're going to leave me. So you want to make sure that you are communicating exactly what you're feeling. And exactly what you're feeling is a series of questions like that. So once you, and this is hard because when you're in the emotion of it, it's really hard to have like a time out and kind of talk your way out of it. So you get better and better at it. It's a practice. And pretty soon you'll be realizing like, oh, I'm getting that feeling again. I'm getting that feeling of, of, of I'm not desirable. I'll never be desirable to anybody again. And so once you get that feeling, what you want to do is communicate it. Now, the way we tend to communicate things definitely are not effective. So what we tend to do, instead of saying, I feel unlovable, we'll say, you have never loved me. You don't care what happens to me. And that's not, so the, the problem with that is that it's not the truth of what's going on for us. The truth is I feel undesirable, but we're saying something else. And then we're assuming things about the other person and maybe you were right maybe you were wrong but the assumption is the problem because the person's going to get defensive right away and as soon as they get defensive guess what they can't attend to that wound that we have they go into their own space so we want to make sure that when we communicate our wounds we know what they are we are kind of clear on what the bottom line is and we start to talk about eye language and feeling language not thought language it's not like I feel that I think, like we tend to do, I feel that you don't do enough for me. No, I feel not loved. I feel uh, dismissed. I feel thrown to the side, that type of thing, rather than I feel you think. <laughs> no, I feel what the feeling is. And to be able to speak from an I language rather than a you language is going to be super much more effective. It's going to get you such different results than the other stuff. And also when you find yourself, because this is part of communication too, but more on the side of listening, when you find yourself being defensive, that's not communicating because you can't be defensive and listen at the same time. You're so involved in your own issues that um, you miss you miss what the person is trying to convey to you. So anytime you're getting defensive, it's another, it's kind of a red flag that you're not communicating in the, in, in the most effective way, even though all of us do it. And by the way, this communication thing is not something that, you know, you do right away and it's really easy. It takes some time and it takes some practice. Um, just remember that you've been taught to communicate the whole exactly opposite way your whole life. And so this is going to take some time. So have some patience with yourself. It will come. It gets easier to do over time. The nonviolent communication people do a great job in kind of delineating what this type of communication looks like and also the Mago people. I will um, definitely give you some a summary in, in some exercise to do 
with those models in mind. But if you wanted to, you know, research it more on your own, there's plenty of books on it on the nonviolent communication and imago therapy. The last part about um, making your communication more effective, which will lead to more healing and less conflict, which will then help you address these sexual issues, is holding each other's wounds, which, um, which is being able to listen in a way that's effective. So like we said in the previous video, if your partner says, you don't love me, it's, that's, that one's like advanced level stuff, you know, because then you have to, you know, first of all, they should be trying to say it in more language, just like I don't feel loved rather than you don't love me. But if they make a mistake and they go into the, you don't love me in an accusatory sort of matter, you know, after a while you'll be able to, to take a moment and say, oh, I know this is their theme. This is what comes up often for them. Let me see if I can take a space that's non-defensive and non-focused on how I feel because they said that, but rather hold that feeling for them. And the way that you hold the feeling for somebody else is they say something like, I feel unlovable right now. And you're thinking, or you don't love me, let's say, you're thinking that is the craziest thing that you've ever heard because you definitely love this person. You love them very deeply, but yet they feel unloved. And so that's the thing is a lot of times we understand what's going on, not through the lens just of what's going on, but also through the lens of what we bring to the table from the past. So if I have a history of not being, a feeling not being loved, and then I feel an inkling of that in this relationship, I'm gonna go straight there and I'm gonna say, you don't love me. I'm not gonna say, hey, that old feeling's coming up for me right now. I'm gonna say, you don't love me. I feel unloved in this relationship. And for the person that's hearing it, they feel like that's craziness. And so they'll say something like, that's crazy. I love you this way, blah, 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 blah. And you shouldn't be feeling like this. And that's basically invalidating and you just stay away from the feeling that's coming up for them. But what you want to know is that by attending to that feeling and saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry you're feeling like that. I don't want you to feel like that. You're not saying that it's true that you don't love them or that, you know, it's, it's, it's true that you don't do all, all kinds of things to make them feel love. What you're saying is that what they're feeling in that moment is true that their feeling is true. Not, you're not agreeing to everything that goes along with it. You're just being trying to be empathetic for that very real feeling that that person's having. Because that person, no matter how crazy it is, is definitely feeling it to be true in that moment. And that's what the important piece is. So if you meet them there and you're empathetic and you say, oh, you can imagine, just imagine what that person must feel like to feel on love or to feel rejected or to feel like they're not good enough. If you could just imagine what it must be like to be feeling that, you can respond to it in that way. Sometimes it helps because, you know, with, with the people that you have a history with and there's some conflict, it's hard to get that empathy going. So you might want to think about like, well, if my friend told me that they were feeling unloved in their relationship, what would I say to them? Most often what we say is like, that sucks. You shouldn't have to feel that way. And so that's sometimes that helps to create some empathy to be able to imagine what that person's feeling. And if you can't imagine that, imagine what it would, what you would respond if a friend were feeling like that. So the point is to be able to hold any feeling, no matter how ridiculous or crazy it sounds or unfair or not true, and be able to say, wow, that sucks. Yeah. That's gonna give you, that's gonna help the person heal because you're holding the feelings with them. And if you do the opposite, which is what we tend to do, it's like, no, that's crazy. You shouldn't be feeling that way. We invalidate the feeling, which makes the feeling bigger, doesn't heal it. And then that person feels, um, alienated from from you doesn't feel connected because you haven't you haven't met them there you haven't been empathetic and the more you're empathetic and the more you meet them there the more intimacy the more connection and guess what the more sex eventually again if you find yourself being defensive you are not listening you are not holding those feelings when you're in defensive mode you cannot hear somebody else you're all involved in your own stuff and um, so you're moving away from what I call, from what is more effective in this situation. So watch those red flags of being defensive and back your way out. It's the wrong way to go. Back your way out of that and, and start over again by saying, wait, wait, I was just getting defensive. That Let me see if I can empathize with this person and meet them here. 
The other thing that happens a lot is when somebody tells us about their pain, we want to fix it right away. We want to do something about it. We want to figure it out. We want to talk about it endlessly and we want to figure out how to wait, get out of, help that person get out of that feeling. That tends to be not the right way, not the most effective way to go about it. So anytime you, you find yourself in fix it mode, try to back yourself out of that one too. Unless some people find it helpful to ask the person, do you need me to help you try to find ways or to resolve this or do you need me to just listen and, and be here with you? And, and most often the people know what they need and they'll say, no, I just need you to hear, I just need to vent. I definitely don't want to go into problem solving mode. I think a lot of times we think that the people that are feeling these things haven't gone through problem solving mode. That's like somehow or another, we know more than like we can figure this out when they've spent endless amounts of hours trying to figure this out. And so, and it's not about figuring it out because that's about moving away from the feeling. It's more about staying there with the feeling. Here we're going to talk about uh, the exercise of staying with your feelings which again is important because what we typically do is we feel a distressing feeling, it feels yucky, and what we wanna do is move away from it. So we cope with it in some way. And we do this in all different types of ways. We, we exercise, we drink, we make love or have sex, we work. We do all kinds of things to move away from this distressing feeling that we have. And one of the really important ways that we move away from feelings is thinking. We start to think our way out of it. And all those things, what happens is that it doesn't allow us to give the feelings what it needs, which is an embrace, being attended to and being acknowledged. You want to do this every time you have a distressing feeling come up. You want to be able to say, okay, I'm feeling this feeling. It's okay to feel this feeling. I am going to embrace this feeling. I am just gonna feel this. It's gonna be very different than I'm feeling this way and it hurts and what I wanna do is go have a drink or what I wanna do is go watch some TV. So what that does is if you stay with the feeling, not only does it help us heal from the original wound that created that feeling, but it also keeps us away from reacting to our feelings. And the reaction to our feelings is most often much more problematic than the feeling itself. So if I feel a negative feeling and every time I go and have a drink or I work too much or I think too much, that working too much, that thinking too much, that drinking too much gets us into more trouble. And it definitely does not heal the feeling to begin with. So that's an important piece is that if we stay with this mindful meditation type of exercise with our feelings, we are not going to be in reactive mode. And reactive mode also is very damaging in the relationship. Because if my reaction to pain is to move away from you, that doesn't create intimacy, that doesn't create understanding and definitely doesn't create resolution. So that's another important piece to this staying with feelings is it stops our reactivity in, in, by, you know, individually, but it also start, stops the reactivity in our relationships, which can be quite damaging. The first step is to become aware of what you're feeling, obviously, if you're gonna stay with it and, you know, knowing what your themes are would help in this. So you would say like, oh, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling unloved. I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. And to know that you're feeling that and then to locate it, how do you know you're feeling that? Where in your body are you feeling that? And most of the time people feel this in their chest. So you wanna say, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Where am I feeling it? It's right here in my chest or right here in my head. I'm just going to feel it. It's okay to feel anxious. And the reason I, I, I ask you to locate it in your body is so that you can, you have an anchor, you have a place to go to. So you're gonna say, okay, I'm feeling, I'm feeling unloved. I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. It's right here in my chest. I'm gonna stay right here in my chest with this feeling. And sometimes you can't label the feelings, but you can feel something in your body that's off. So that's also great. The other, if you can't locate anything in your body, just choose a part of your body. The point is that you wanna stay out of your head and in your body because it, your body is where your feelings reside. So you wanna stay out of your head and in your body. So as soon as you say, okay, I'm feeling like I'm not good enough, I'm going to embrace it, I'm gonna sit here and feel it, it's right here in my chest. The first thing that's gonna happen is a thought will come into your head. 
And as soon as that thought comes in, which could be like so, so many different types of thoughts, like, yeah, you, you, you know, this is why you don't feel like you're not good enough or no, no wait, you do, you are good enough or no. Do you remember when you weren't good enough here? Or do you remember when you were good enough here? I mean, the thoughts just keep on coming. So as soon as a thought comes in, which will be immediately at the beginning, you want to say, nope, no feelings, no thoughts. I'm going to stay here in my feelings in my chest. And then right away, another thought will come in and you're going to redirect it to your chest. So the whole time you're going from thought to feeling, which is different sometimes from meditation, from that meditation that I know of anyway, which is to be maybe in a non-thinking, non-feeling state. But this is more about like no thinking, definitely, but going into a feeling state. So you're really staying with the feeling and not in your head. So every time a thought comes in, you, you re- you focus on the feeling you have in your body. And what will happen over time is that you'll feel this feeling less often and less intensely, which is a great thing. And it helps, so that's why it helps you regulate the feeling. And you're definitely staying with the feeling and not engaging in the reaction to the feeling. There's no need to react to the feeling because you're staying with it. By-step process of how to change all these dynamics that we've been talking about. Now remember the goal here is to give some space to the responsive desire, to figure out what the responsive desire needs in order to open up and what needs to be taken away so it doesn't close down. So that's the goal here. And so it should be something exciting. It should be something you're looking forward to. The first step is to stop having any sex you don't want to have. That's pretty detrimental, in, at least in the, mod, in the model that I follow and the model that I use. That sounds pretty easy, but it's actually really hard. I mean, it sounds pretty easy for the person that is stopping having sex that they don't want. It's, it's like, oh, you just get to do what you want. Well, no, this, this person is going to struggle quite a bit in, in, in dealing with the feelings that come along with not providing to their partner what they need. It's really scary. Well, are you going to leave me? Are you going to find somebody else? Are you not going to love me anymore? Are you going to move away even more from me? And, and, and then the question of like, do I really want this? Do I don't? What do I want? What do, what don't I want? All those things are, it's a difficult process as well as it's a difficult process on the other end to be able to be okay with this person taking this time and this space to figure out what they want in sex and to figure out what their desire is organically. So as this person is working on not having any type of sexual encounters that they don't want to have, the other person that has the, the greater desire, has spontaneous desire, has to work on becoming what I call Zen about sex. They have to work on becoming truly calm and okay with whatever is going on in their, in their sexual relationship which is very difficult if you've had years and years and years of not getting your needs met sexually. And if you had years and years and years of conflict around this, and finally you go to, you go take this class or you go to therapy and you're like, okay, now I'm going to get what I need. And the first thing that we do as a therapist or that this program does, it says, well, no, 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 you got to wait. You got to wait a while. And actually you're not going to, we're going to, we're going to up the ante and you're not going to get sex at all, maybe for quite a while. And so that's really, I understand that's truly difficult to do. And also you might think, oh, I've done this a million times. You know, I, I have stopped sex. I have stopped wanting sex. I've stopped asking for sex and then nothing happens. Yes, that that's, I, mean, I, I believe you. The thing is that some other things need to happen at the same time. And when you say I've stopped asking for sex or I've stopped wanting for sex, have you also stopped becoming grumpy about it? Have you also stopped uh, withdrawing because of it? That's, that's super key here because if you just stop asking for sex and you stop, um, wanting sex, but then you're removed, you're withdrawn, you're giving the cold shoulder, you're angry, you're frustrated. Those are the things that create pressure for the other person to engage in sex eventually. So maybe you'll go a month without asking for it verbally directly. And then that person feels the buildup, feels the other person feels the buildup, feels the frustration because, and, and then you're not giving the responsive desire what it needs, which is connection, attention. You're withdrawn, you're angry, and that shuts it down. And so that person end, ends up having sex with you, even though the things that their desire needs aren't there. So the part about be, becoming really okay with 
this process is super important. Trying to regulate your emotions around this is key. You really want to address what's coming up for you emotionally and regulate them like we did it, like the exercise we did in the past. But not only that, start to talk about it, but definitely not with your partner. So this goes against all kind of couples therapy approaches. This part you do not want to share with your partner because that sharing in itself is creating pressure, has created pressure. And I'm not saying that you won't be able to express your feelings and desires around sex forever. I'm talking about just for a little while. So what you want to do is not eat up these feelings, but maybe express them in a form of like, you know, writing about it, talking about it to a friend or to another professional. So those are the things that are really going to help in this process, because the goal is for you to allow the responsive desire, the, the space and the tranquility and the ease for it to show up how it does organically. The other part with becoming okay with this process is take a step back and let that person come to you. Stop um, trying so hard. Start, stop even caring about sex. And, and sometimes what I tell my clients is think of this as, I don't know, you're going to a monastery for three months and there is not going to be any sex. And, and that might help you and put a timeline to it. Say, okay, I'm not going to care. I'm not going to look for sex for the next six months and see what happens. Sometimes your brain needs some type of uh, bookends as far as time and that helps it kind of stay the course rather than I'm going to do this forever because you're not going to do this forever. This is a temporary thing to try to see what it is that the responsive desire needs and what it's getting that it doesn't need. It shuts it down. The other piece that's super important and super hard is that while you're becoming okay with this and then about sex, you don't want to withdraw at all. You don't want to stop being connected and stop being fun and, and flirtatious with your partner because that's not going to work either. So you, you have the very difficult task of regulating your emotions, becoming okay with this thing that has been definitely not been okay with you. And at the same time, remaining connected. It is a tall order, but it is, but nonetheless, it's what needs to be done in order to correct this dynamic that, that has been going on for a long time. Sometimes some things that help with this is asking yourself the question, well, if suddenly I couldn't have sex or I couldn't be sexually desirable, where would I get my value from? Where would I get my source of inspiration from? Where would I get my, my, you know, my motivation from? Those, that is an important question to ask so that you can ease off on the value you, you get from the sexual encounters and maybe find values in other areas. So these are things that, these little things that I'm talking about help you become more Zen about the lack of sex. The other thing you want to think about is like, if you were single and you hadn't had sex for even a year, you probably wouldn't be as, uh, as upset as you are now. There is some meaning making around the fact that you're not having sex. It's not that you're not having sex. That's, that's the problem is that you perceive that not having sex as that person doesn't want you. That person doesn't love you. That person doesn't care. That person cares about other things over that. That person's being selfish, etc. So you want to know that it's not that I'm not, I'm not going to die without sex. I might not even be upset that I'm not having sex if I did, if I wasn't in this relationship, but it's the fact that this person doesn't want me. That's how I'm understanding the lack of sex. So you might want to start to try to understand the lack of sex, not that that person doesn't want you, but that there have been situations in this relationship, but that there have been dynamics in the relationship that have created a shutdown in one of the, in, in one of the desires, rather than there's something wrong with me and there's something wrong with you, but rather the combination of both of us have created this situation. So you have the one person working on not having any sex that they don't want to. You have the other person becoming more Zen about it. And then we can't just, you know, leave it all up to the person to be okay without, with not having sex. There will be moments where they'll be grumpy. They'll be upset. They'll be withdrawn. And that might be because of the sexual situation or might, that might be because of something else. But what happens is that the person that is witnessing this, these behaviors becomes distressed, becomes 
um, feeling pressure to, in some, some, some way or another, soothe that person, which is what we, sh I guess, it's beautiful thing of what we do for each other, but then it, it can become problematic and dysfunctional at times. So the person that is, is, is witnessing the grumpiness, the anger, the isolation, also needs to become a little bit more tolerant of it too. Like it's okay for your partner to be a little bit upset. It's okay for your partner to withdraw a little bit. It doesn't mean maybe what you think it means. And you might wanna even check in with them. When you withdraw, does that mean that you don't wanna be with me anymore? When you're withdrawn, does that mean you're angry with me? Or even better yet, and this, these are all part of the exercise we've done. When, when you withdraw, I feel like, your the, the relationship is in trouble i feel like the relationship is going to end so that you start to understand and become more tolerant of this person's behavior because once you understand it and the person says no when i withdraw maybe i am a little angry with you and maybe i am losing hope but i what it what it really means is that um, i'm scared and i need some space and i need to recuperate Nonetheless, the person that is engaged with the distressing emotion from their partner, not, not, we can't just ask the partner to say, hey, just regulate all your emotions and become the next Buddha. More so like, yes, you're going to try to regulate your emotions while I try to regulate my emotions to your emotions, while I try to become more tolerant of the fact that you're upset right now, that it's okay if you're upset that it's okay if you don't have sex, that you're not gonna die if you don't have sex, that type of idea. We're doing this for a time where it's an experiment and you will be okay. You will not die from this. The next step in this process is to have an understanding that things can start and stop at any moment. So if I flirt with you, that can just be it. I'm flirting with you, it ends there. Or if I touch you, that's it, I can just touch you and it ends there. Or if I kiss you, it can stop there. Or if I, even if I take, you know, take off your pants and fondle you, I can do that and it can stop. The understanding that any type of physical contact can start and stop whenever you want is hugely important in this process because what often happens is that person doesn't even wanna touch the other person, kiss the other person, flirt with the other person because they say, if I do that, that means I have to have sex. And maybe in that moment, they're not feeling like they want to, they don't have the time, they don't have the energy. And so what happens is that you miss out on this really rich um, you know, bucket of experiences that aren't leading to penetrative orgasmic sex, but that can be quite nonetheless satisfying and also fill your bucket. So a lot of people, when they're not having sex, you know, what, they, what they're really saying is, I don't feel connected, I don't feel desired by you. So when we, you know, when we let this happen, this affection, this physical contact without having expectations, then suddenly our partner is giving us lots of experiences of feeling wanted and needed and desired. Next step is to change your idea of initi initiation, that change your idea of I am initiating sex. Typically what we think of is uh, something like, do you wanna have sex tonight? Or, um, you know, I'm in the mood, how about you? Or how about later we have some sexy time? So the, um, the initiation is often thought of as like straight to penetrative orgasmic sex. That's for a lot of people. I know some of you um, are a little more subtle about this. But what we need to do is change that directness that, hey, I want to have penetrative orgasmic sex to what you might have done at the beginning, which is, hey, I'm going on a date with someone. I'm not going to go straight out and like touch their boob and say, you want to, you want to, you want to go fuck, right? You're not going to do that. I mean, some people do, and that's perfectly normal, but in general, you want to set up a date and start talking. And if that person's smiling a lot to you and you're flirting and they're flirting back, you have this idea that there's this energy which might propel you to touch them, which might propel you to kiss them. And if that touch and that kiss is, is received well, then you can go on to the next step. So it's a series of progressive steps in order to get maybe somewhere because you go out on a date and you have a hope maybe that you'll have sex, but it's not an expectation. So that's the difference. And to bring that type of spirit back into the relationship is hugely important because the response of desire needs a progressive type of approach because it doesn't just 
feel desire. It needs to kind of be um, motivated. It needs to be inspired and it needs to be like a step by step process. So if you think about, you know, initiation in, in this way, it, it's going to help the responsive desire. It's also going to help in that insecurity about initiating. Some of you have had many years of struggle with this and maybe shut down as far as initiating sex. And so to change your framework around it is going to be important to get you through, to get you to bypass that fear that you have. To think about initiation as just an expression of a moment. You start off by just saying, hey, I like you, or I'm liking you right now. And so you're not saying, I want to have sex. You're not initiating sex. You're just expressing a moment. And that's hugely important, and which leads us to the next step, which expressing moments where you feel a slight blip in energy. So we all, I often talk about the experience of love as being pretty um, stable. Like you love this person. So it's kind of like a flat line. And then there are moments where it just beeps up a little bit. Like it just increases a tiny bit. And those are the moments where I, where I refer to as like, I'm in like with you right now. I'm liking you right now. So I love you. I always love you. But then there's this moment where you're doing something really cool or you said something really funny or you brushed against me in a, in, in a certain way. So all these experiences that just raise that frequency just slightly are super important to start noticing in this process, but then to start expressing them and to start telling your partner that you're feeling this slight blip in energy. And so there's an exercise that I'll ask you to do, which is how, what's your favorite way of having somebody express this to you, which is flirting really. When we tell somebody that we like them, that's what flirting is. When we express to somebody, hey, I'm feeling this energy that's flirting and there's so many different ways of flirting. So what you, you're gonna do in this exercise is to write down all your favorite ways of being flirted with and all your favorite ways of flirting to some, for somebody else. So it's a, so both, and so that you understand, so both you and your partner understand like, oh, when they do this, they're flirting with me. Because you may not understand that they're flirting because it's not your language, it's not your favorite way of doing it. Because you may not understand that when your partner's being playful with you, they're expressing that blip in energy. So I often think about like, oh, one person speaking Spanish and the other person is speaking French. And that in actuality, if you guys both spoke different languages, you would do your best to try to learn each other's languages so that you can understand what they're saying to you. So the same goes with here, and I'm sure most of you have heard of the love languages, but this goes a little bit beyond that and more like, when I do this, that means I'm, I'm expressing to you that I like you. But also, let me express to you that I like you in the way that you're gonna understand it. So not only am I expressing that I like you as you would understand it, I'm also expressing to you in my organic way. And, and then on the other side, I should know what your organic way is so that when you're playful with me, I understand that you're actually flirting with me. So that's, that's an important part of, of this process is the expression of like, because that's, the, that's where it all starts, right? You, like, except for, again, if we go back to the example, if I'm, I'm starting to date again, you're not gonna go out on a date and not have this expression because then nobody knows where they stand, you know? Like if you don't tell the other person that you like them in some way or another, whether that's by paying attention or being curious or asking them out again or touching them or flirting with them, they're, they're not, there's not gonna be a relationship. So there's this back and forth of expression of I like you and that's, we need to bring that back. So that's this step is start to notice and express those little blips of energy that you feel. The next step in the process is to change your expectations about the sex that you do have when you have it, not the sex, but the physical moments that you do have. Many people have expectations around sexual physical contacts as it should be penetrative and it should be orgasmic. So what you wanna do is say, well, look at all your best sexual experiences in your life and think about what made this such a great experience. Aside from the physical pleasure, yes, we all get physical pleasure, but what was it about those situations that really um, made you feel like this was a great experience? Write those down and your partner's gonna write their own set of, of, of things down 
and compare so that you both can come up with an alternative um, list of what would make a sexual encounter satisfying or great for for both of you. So you have different set of expectations and values around the sexual experience. A lot of people talk about, most people, I would say when I talk about this, they say that the most important for, thing for them to make sex great is connection and fun. <laughs> and just those two things come up over and over again. So that's just a slight hint to you that those things might, imagine if your sexual experiences or your physical contacts were determined to be good or bad by how much fun and how much connection you had rather than whether you orgasm or whether you could get hard or whether you have penetrative sex, uh, you would be having a lot more satisfying sex, I'm guessing. Another step that's super important is incorporate the things that you have figured out make you a sexier person. And that's it. It's super important to what I call water the plant. So your relationship I see as a plant that needs minimal watering in order to survive. You cannot leave a plant without water. It will die. So the same thing with the relationship. You need to water it and you need to find out what the minimum amount of water it needs in order to at least survive. And typically relationships need at least a minimal once a week type of engagement. And once you realize like, oh, you mean if once a week we water this plan and we water it well and we spend some really quality time together where we're having lots of fun and lots of connection, then maybe we can release ourselves of the responsibility and the pressure to do that all the time. And so that, that, that gives us some freedom to engage in the other things that we want full hearted. But when we do come together, it's a really special moment. Or it could be like maybe our, water, our plant needs, we want to water it more. We want to take care of it more. It, we don't need to be thinking about just minimal amount. We want to water it every day. And maybe so every day for an hour, we have a really good hour of connection. But the point being is to be intentional about watering the plant, knowing that it, you can't go a week without watering it, for example. Well, you might, but it's going to wilter a little bit and then you have to add some water. But the point being is that we're going to be intentional about this. We're going to think about, did we water the plant this week? Did we water the plant th today? And what, what do we both think would create a, a good experience for this plant? When you go back to when you first started dating, you usually had like a particular night where you went out. So the same thing can go for your relationship. Oh, Friday nights is, our, is our, the, night, the night that we go out. So Friday nights, let's go out. But the goal should be, let's not go out, not to go out and then have sex, but to go out and have fun and see what happens. So you're scheduling fun. You're not scheduling sex, which is slightly different than maybe what you've tried in the past. The other thing you want to make sure you're doing is that any physical situation or experience that you have with your partner, you want to make sure that it ends in a positive note because there's a lot of negative associations probably if you spent a long time in this negative space with sex. So anytime you have a physical contact, make sure that you end in a positive note. And it doesn't mean that you have to end in a sexual positive note. It means like, let's say, I don't know, something, something that just didn't the, the, the spirit, you know, the, the fun went out of it. Uh, you just couldn't connect. Nothing really happened. It kind of fell flat or even worse. It kind of was a little negative at times. So what you want to do is maybe end that situation with some cuddling or some talking or some watching TV together or just anything that would be positive and non-threatening for sure. The goal of all of this is to understand the responsive desire, what opens it up and what closes it up. So you want to make sure that you're both taking note and maybe even writing it down of, oh, these are the things that I need, that my desire needs in order to open up. And these are the things it definitely doesn't need. So pay attention to those and give it the importance that, that it needs. I mean, you're, you have probably spent years in a problematic sexual relationship that has been harmful for both of you. So if you figure out, oh, this is the way to get back there, make sure that you pay attention and you give it the importance because it's truly important. It truly is what that desire needs. I think we, we kind of figure this out and we don't give it the importance that it needs. So for example, if, and, and this is hard, um, I had a client yesterday that realized like I work so much and when I, when I suddenly have four days off, my desire starts to come up a bit. So what does that mean for that person? That means she actually has to think about making a choice between her work, which is truly important, 
and the sexual desire and what a hard decision to make. But if she does decide that her sexual desire and her relationship are the things that are important to her right now and that need to be, she might have to pay for that, pay with giving up some of the work. I think we want to, um, things to change without having anything else change, which is not very effective. A lot of times the change requires some payment of some sort, some sacrifice of some sort. All through this process, I think we need, need to be focused on raising the voice, the agency, and the power of the, of the responsive desire, because most women have had some sort of, um, because most women have experienced the opposite of that. It's in sometimes more than, you know, more to more extremes than, than others. So, you know, we often experience not having agency, voice of power, especially when it comes to our sexuality. And if we have any sort of trauma around this, whether it's trauma within the relationship or trauma in our personal life, we need to be really focused on increasing voice, agency, and power in the sexual relationship throughout this whole process. So anytime you get a chance to, to give voice, give power to the responsive desire, do that because it'd be quite healing. And remember that all the stuff that we're doing is to get you closer to what you want, is to get you to have a more satisfying sexual relationship. Even though it might seem counterintuitive, some of the things like, hey, let me let me be okay with the fact that you don't want your hips touched. How is, you know, and, and old thinking would say, well, how is that ever gonna get me closer to touching your hips? Well, it actually is. When you say, okay, I'm not gonna touch your hips because it's a no, it's something that you don't want and I'm giving you power and agency, suddenly maybe you have more of a choice, you have more of a chance of ever touching those hips with that step. Because if you continue to push and touch the hips when the person doesn't want to, what you're gonna do is increase the traumatic response or increase the resistance to that, which eventually will create a shutdown. Now, if you, this is just an example, by the way, I hope you know that, you know, the touching of the hips. But if you touch the hips and the person says, no, I don't want you to touch my hips and you don't, that person feels a sense of empowerment and, and a sense of control. And so they are much more um, apt to say, well, okay, I can trust that this is not going to be touched when I say it's not good. So let me see if I can play around with it. Let me see if I can let him touch it for a little bit and then tell him to stop. Or let me see if I can um, find a way to have it touched that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't bring up the same issues for me. Finally, the last step is, and it's probably after you're having some sexual experiences together, you want to often be in conversation uh, with this type of question, like, what do you want more of? What do you want less of? So I see this exercise, you know, now, you know, what do you want more of, what you want less of in sex? But at this point, you may not know that because this is the whole point is trying to understand the responsive desire or you, so it, it's okay if you can't do that now, but you might want to do it later after you start to discover and have some sexual experiences that are on your terms. But if you do have a list now, and for example, one thing that mo a lot of people talk about, I want it to go slower. I want to have more time before we go into the penetrative sex. I want more foreplay. Often, a lot of people answer that. So if you know that already, you want to be able to express that to your partner so that they can start incorporating that right away. And you wanna be specific, like I want more foreplay. Well what do I mean by foreplay? It, does that mean kissing? Does that mean touching? Does that mean flirting? Does that, how long do I want the foreplay? Do I want it to last the whole day? Some people do. Do I want it to last a few minutes? So the specificity is sometimes important because people understand many things by foreplay, for example, like what, what, and people that may not have that much experience too, may not know exactly what to do with, 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 whatever it is that you bring up, especially something like foreplay and flirting. Um, a lot of people haven't had a lot of experience with it, so they don't know exactly what to do. So um, to engage in this process of having open communication about what you want more of and what you want less of is something that's going to enrich your sexual experiences. I hope that by following all these steps, you have found some 
way that's different in engaging with each other and that you might be having more satisfying sexual relationships. That is my hope. Although I do understand that a course like this might not completely do it. So if you find yourself taking this course and, and not and, and not seeing much of a change or struggling with the change, talk to a therapist, talk to, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sex therapist. It'd probably be better if it's a sex therapist, but talk to a therapist because sometimes, the, you know, the, the, the therapist can help you navigate some complicated, complicated issues. But this is a good course to start off with, see if things change for you with this. And if they don't, then to seek further help, especially if you're dealing with anything like violence and sexual abuse, you want to pay, you want to give that a little bit more attention.